All right, buckle up everybody, because today we are diving deep, deep into NASA's Artemis II mission. Humanity's return to the moon. Yeah, and we've got a fantastic source for this deep dive, an article straight from NASA's official website, taking us behind the scenes. Right to the heart of the action. So we're gonna go way beyond the headlines, figure out what makes Artemis II so special. How it fits into the grand scheme of the Artemis program. And really get a sense of what this all means for the future of space exploration. You know, it, it really is a monumental leap forward, this mission. Yeah. Artemis II isn't simply about, like, revisiting the moon. It's not just a quick trip. No, not at all. It's a crucial stepping stone in, you know, establishing that permanent human presence that we've been dreaming of. A permanent presence on the moon. On the moon. And this is all about testing, proving the technology. That will eventually get us to Mars. Exactly. So it's like a dress rehearsal, but in deep space. With astronauts on board. Wow, talk about high stakes. This is paving the way for Artemis III, which is where we actually land back on the lunar surface. The main event. The main event, but we got to make sure this test flight goes off without a hitch. Absolutely. Think of it as a a shakedown cruise for all the systems and procedures. Make sure everything's working. Exactly. And having a human crew on board adds that extra layer of complexity, that realism. They need to be certain everything works flawlessly out in deep space before committing to even greater challenges. Before they go for a lunar landing. Precisely. Okay, so Artemis II, it's a mission of many firsts, a lot of risks. I'm already hooked. Let's break down the mission step by step. First things first, how are they even getting off this planet? Right. The article talks about the massive space launch system. The SLS rocket. Carrying the Orion spacecraft, blasting off from Kennedy Space Center. It's going to be a truly spectacular sight. Imagine being there. Oh, I yeah. witnessed that raw power. But they're not going directly to the moon, are they? Not straight there. There's a carefully designed sequence of maneuvers to test Orion even before it gets Earth's orbit. Oh, that's interesting. So walk us through it. Okay, so picture this. After launch, Orion will first enter a smaller elliptical orbit around Earth. Okay, so just circling the Earth. Yeah, for initial checks, make sure everything's functioning as expected. S systems check. Got to make sure Absolutely. everything's a go. Green across the board. But then comes the exciting part. Okay, what happens next? They boost into a massive elliptical orbit. Massive. Reaching 46,000 miles high. Whoa, 46,000 miles. That's much further out than most satellites. That's right. Why such a huge orbit? What's the advantage of that? Well, it serves multiple purposes. Mm -hmm. First, it allows them to really push Orion's life support systems. Push it to the limits. To their limits, yeah. Yeah. They need to test their reliability over these extended periods. Right, because they're going to be out there for a while. Absolutely. They'll be monitoring those systems during high energy activities like exercise and low energy periods like sleep, simulating those conditions they'll face during the lunar flyby. It's like a stress test for the life support. Making sure it can handle everything that deep space travel throws at it. You got it. But there must be more to it than just testing life support, right? You're sharp. There is. It just seems like a pretty extreme maneuver just for that one purpose. You're right. This high Earth orbit is also about simulating deep space communication and navigation challenges. Oh, I see what you're getting at. They're going way beyond the reach of our GPS satellite. Exactly. At that distance, they'll be relying on NASA's deep space network. Okay, the deep space network. It's a system of these giant antennas. I've heard of that, yeah. Stationed around the globe to communicate with mission control. So how do they make sure these messages are getting through loud and clear when they're a quarter of a million miles away. Well, think about it. You're sending a signal to the moon and back. Mm -hmm. Along the way, it's getting weaker. Getting weaker. Picking up interference. Space is a noisy place. Right. You got cosmic rays, solar flares, all sorts of things messing with that signal. I wouldn't want to be the one troubleshooting that connection. <laughs> no kidding. So the Deep Space <laughs> Network uses these incredible techniques like uh, error correction coding. It's like weaving redundancy into the signal. Okay. You send multiple copies of the message, but each copy is slightly different. So even if some parts get garbled... They can reconstruct the original message mm -hmm. by comparing the different copies. It's like a cosmic game of telephone, but they always win. You got it. That's really clever. So Artemis II is going to be a big test for these systems, making sure they can handle the demands of future missions. Especially those to Mars. All right, so we've got this powerful rocket launch, this super high orbit to test the life support communications, and we haven't even left Earth's orbit yet. We're just getting started. Remember, the article mentioned one more critical test before setting course for the moon. They're going to use the ICPS. 
The what? The interim cryogenic propulsion stage. Okay, the ICPS. For more than just giving Orion that final push to escape Earth's gravity. Right, that final push. But it's more than just that. Okay, I'm intrigued. What else are they going to do with this ICPS? After it's done its main job, it becomes a target. The astronauts practice manually piloting Orion. Wait, they get to take the spacecraft for a spin? They do. Well, it's not just for fun, although I'm sure it's pretty amazing. It's got to be a little fun, though, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But it's about honing those crucial skills, those rendezvous and docking maneuvers. Which will be essential for missions like Artemis III, right? And beyond. Imagine docking with a lunar lander on the moon's surface. Or retrieving samples from a spacecraft orbiting Mars. So it's like a deep space driving test? You could say that. But instead of parallel parking, they're docking with this massive piece of space hardware. Exactly. What happens if they bump into it? Hopefully they won't. Mm. But that's the point of the exercise, giving them that experience. The confidence. The confidence to handle Orion in close proximity to other spacecraft. So they're not just testing the spacecraft, they're testing themselves. Pushing their own limits as pilots. Getting ready for even bigger challenges ahead. That's right. This is like a training montage for deep space explorers. A great way to put it. Mm. And it highlights that key element of the Artemis program. It's not just about developing the tech. It's about the humans. It's about developing that human capability to explore, to operate in deep space. I'm starting to really understand why this mission is so important. Yeah. They're building a foundation for a future where we can actually live and work beyond Earth. It's pretty amazing. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Step by step. Back to the mission. They've launched, they've checked their systems, practice their piloting, they're ready to head towards the moon. Right. You got it. They've gone through the ultimate pre-flight checklist. And now it's time for the main event. The translunar injection burn. Okay, so they've got their license to drive, they've practiced parking. And now they're hitting the interstellar highway. What exactly happens during this translunar injection burn? This is where they break free from Earth's orbit and set sail for the moon. So they're firing up the engines. But here's the cool part. NASA has designed this trajectory so that Orion will naturally swing around the moon and get pulled back towards Earth by gravity. Wait, gravity does the work on the way back. That's right. It's called a free return trajectory. Like a cosmic slingshot. Isn't that a little risky, relying on gravity alone for the return journey? It's calculated, for sure. But this trajectory has multiple backup options. Okay, so just in case. If they need to, they can fire Orion's engines, fine-tune the path. That's just corrections. But the beauty is it minimizes fuel consumption which is mm -hmm. crucial for longer missions. Especially to Mars. Where every ounce of fuel matters. So efficiency and flexibility. It's all about balance. Maximizing their chances of success, but also having a backup plan. Always got to have a plan B. That's pretty impressive. And it highlights another crucial aspect of deep space missions. It's all about resource management. Resource management. They have to calculate their fuel, oxygen, food, everything meticulously planned. It's like planning a cross-country road trip. But instead of snacks, they're calculating orbital mechanics. Precisely. There's no stopping for gas along the way. Nope, and no room for air. Wow, that's a lot of pressure. They have to anticipate every scenario, have contingency plans. Okay, so they've executed the burn. They're on their way to the moon. Gravity's got their back for the return. All systems go. What happens next? What will the astronauts experience as they venture further from Earth than any human before them? That, my friend, is where the real magic happens. Buckle up, because in part two, we're going on a journey beyond the familiar. We're going to be exploring the wonders and the challenges of deep space travel. You ready for liftoff? All right, so we left off with our Artemis II crew rocketing towards the moon on this free return trajectory. It's going to be quite a ride. What's next for them? What are these astronauts in for as they journey further from Earth than any human has gone before? Well, as they leave Earth's orbit, they're going to witness something Truly spectacular. What's that? The Earth shrinking in the distance. Oh, wow. Becoming smaller and smaller against the backdrop of stars. They'll see our planet as this tiny, fragile world, a pale blue dot in the vastness of space. I can't even imagine that perspective shift. Seeing our whole planet, everything we know, reduced to a tiny speck in the cosmic void. It must be both humbling and exhilarating. Humbling, yeah, definitely. It really makes you realize, you know, the Earth is just one world 
among countless others out there. Wow. And it's exhilarating because it opens up this whole new realm of possibilities for us, for human exploration. It's true. It makes you realize how much we take for granted here. The air, the water, this stable climate. All those things we depend on. From that distance, it's all just this thin, fragile layer clinging to the surface. It really highlights how important it is to protect our planet, mm -hmm. you know, make sure it's sustainable for future generations. And it underscores the importance of space exploration itself. As a way to expand our knowledge. To find alternative homes for humanity, maybe, if we ever need them. Exactly. So it's not just scientific curiosity. It's about survival, long-term survival. That adds a whole new layer to the mission. It's about the future of our species. Wow, okay, but let's not get too philosophical just yet. Right, back to the mission. There's another incredible experience waiting for the Artemis II crew. Oh, absolutely. As they approach the moon, they're going to see the far side. The side we never see from Earth. The mysterious far side. The one that's always turned away. We've only ever seen it in photos. And satellite images. Is it really as different from the near side as they say? Oh, it is. It's like a time capsule from the early solar system. Heavily cratered, ancient lava flows, towering mountains that have been there for billions of years. Stepping back in time to the formation of the solar system. It's incredible, really. What are they hoping to learn from studying the far side? Well, for one, it's the perfect place to study the lunar surface without any interference from Earth's radio signals. Ah, so it's quiet. Quiet, yeah. Oh. A giant natural radio telescope <sighs> allowing them to study the faint whispers of the early universe. They can listen to the universe. In a way, yeah. That's fascinating. So it's not just what they see, it's what they can hear with their instruments. Precisely. They'll be using sensitive instruments to listen for radio waves from the era right after the Big Bang. Wow, when the first stars and galaxies were forming. Exactly. To understand how everything began. It's a way to probe those deep mysteries of the universe. Okay, so they've looped around the far side of the moon. They've seen these incredible views, maybe even listened in on the early universe. Soaking it all in. Now gravity's pulling them back towards Earth. The journey home begins. Is it just a smooth ride from here? Not quite. They still have to get through Earth's atmosphere. Oh, right. Re-entry. Remember that heat shield we talked about? That's where it comes in. Big time. The ultimate test for the heat shield. Imagine hurling towards Earth at thousands of miles per hour. A thin layer of material between them and, and burning up. That heat shield has to withstand temperatures that could melt steel. And the forces, the G-forces. Immense. But NASA's tested it. Right. Rigorously. They're confident it can handle it. But what about the astronauts themselves? What kind of physical stresses will they experience? They'll be subjected to forces several times stronger than gravity. Wow. It can make it hard to breathe, puts a lot of strain on their bodies. Intense. But they've trained extensively in centrifuges. They're ready for this. So it's like the world's most intense roller coaster, but you have to stay calm and focused. And monitor critical systems. I don't know if I could do it. It takes a special kind of person to be an astronaut. For sure. They have to be physically and mentally prepared for anything. To work as a team under that kind of pressure. Absolutely. They really are pushing the boundaries. They're paving the way for the rest of us. So they've made it through reentry. Safe and sound. Where do they land? According to the article, they'll be slashing down in the Pacific Ocean. Just like the Apollo astronauts. The recovery team will be waiting to pick them up. I bet that's a welcome sight after spending days in that tiny spacecraft. <laughs> Relief, exhilaration, probably a little bit of exhaustion, too. Yeah, I can imagine. It's a triumphant moment, marking the successful completion of a mission that pushes the boundaries of human exploration. But it's also the beginning of a new chapter. What do you mean? Well, once they're back on Earth, the real work begins. What kind of work? Analysis, reflection. The astronauts will have extensive medical checkups to see how space travel affected their bodies. Got to make sure they're healthy and they'll debrief with mission control, share their experiences. So they can learn from it. To help refine future missions. This is a giant feedback loop. It is, yeah. They're not just exploring space, they're exploring the limits of human adaptability, using that knowledge to pave the way for others. Exactly, and the data they collect about the spacecraft, about the astronauts' physiological responses. Oh, that data is important. It's invaluable for designing future missions, ensuring the safety of future explorers. It's amazing how much we learn from each mission. Every time we push those boundaries, we come back with something new. But before we jump into the future, let's take a moment to appreciate the human side of this. The people behind it all. These astronauts are risking their lives to expand our understanding of the universe. They're incredibly brave. What qualities do they possess that make them so special? 
Well, they're highly skilled pilots, engineers, of course, but they also have to be incredibly resilient, adaptable, able to work as a team under extreme pressure. Because space is unforgiving. You could say that again. They'll face unexpected challenges, technical difficulties, the stress of being isolated in such a hostile environment. It takes a lot. But they'll also experience things that few humans have ever witnessed. Moments of awe and wonder. They're like modern day explorers. Venturing into uncharted territory. Pushing the limits. Expanding our understanding. Okay, I'm totally captivated by these astronauts in this mission. It's incredible, isn't it? But let's step back and look at the bigger picture for a minute. Zoom out a bit. Where does Artemis II fit into NASA's long-term plan for space exploration? It's a crucial stepping stone in their plan to establish a sustainable presence on the moon. Not just a visit. No, a presence. <laughs> they envision a future where humans can live and work on the lunar surface. Live on the moon. Yes. Conduct research, develop new technologies, use it as a base for further exploration. So it's about becoming a multi-planetary species. Exactly. That's an ambitious goal. It is, but it's within reach if we continue to invest in space exploration and support the incredible people working to make it happen. I'm starting to see why they call it the Artemis program. It's a fitting name. Artemis, the goddess of the hunt, the wilderness, the moon. Reclucking that ancient symbol of exploration, of adventure. It's a reminder that we're all part of something bigger than ourselves. A cosmic story unfolding all around us. And Artemis II is just one chapter in that story. A story being written by these brave astronauts venturing into the unknown. A story that will continue to unfold as we push further and further into the cosmos. That brings us to the end of part two of our deep dive. Stay tuned for part three, where we'll explore the broader significance of the Artemis II mission. And its implications for the future of space exploration. Wow. We have really covered a lot of ground in this Artemis II deep dive. We have, from the technical nitty-gritty to the sheer ambition of it all. Sending humans back to the moon, it's been quite a journey. Yeah, an incredible journey. We've explored the mission objectives, the challenges, that groundbreaking technology. All the pieces that make it possible. But beyond all the technical marvels and scientific discoveries. There's something deeper here. There's this profoundly inspiring aspect to it all. Definitely. It's a testament to human ambition in our pursuit of knowledge, you know, that drive to understand. It's not just a story for astronauts and scientists. It's a story for all of us. It's about that shared dream of reaching for the stars and exploring the vast unknown. That desire to see what's out there. So we've talked about the technical details, the scientific goals, the human element. But before we wrap up, let's reflect on the bigger picture. The broader significance of Artemis II. What does this mission mean for the future of humanity? I think it represents a turning point in how we relate to space. How so? For so long, space exploration has been limited to low Earth orbit. Right, close to home. But with Artemis, we're venturing further, establishing a foothold on the moon and setting our sights on even bolder destinations. Like Mars. Exactly. We're entering a new era. Where humanity becomes a truly multi-planetary species. What does that future look like? Imagine tapping into the resources of the moon other celestial bodies. Utilizing what's out there. Conducting research on a grand scale. Wow. Building self-sustaining outposts, stepping stones to even further reaches of the cosmos. It sounds like something out of science fiction. It does, but I believe it's a future we can achieve. You really think so? We have the technology, the ingenuity, and most importantly, the will to explore. The drive to push further. Missions like Artemis II are showing us the way. Proving it's possible. That we can overcome those deep space challenges. But it's not going to be easy. No, not at all. Space exploration is inherently challenging. There will be setbacks, risks. It's those challenges that push us, though. That drive innovation. And the rewards. Immeasurable. New knowledge, technologies, a new understanding of our place in the universe. I'm starting to see why this mission is so captivating to so many people. It really grabs you. It's not just about achievements or discoveries. It's about that human spirit of exploration. Pushing beyond what we know. Venturing into the unknown. Artemis II embodies that spirit. Shows us what we're capable of. When we set our minds to it. Absolutely. Well, this has been an incredible deep dive into Artemis II. We've covered a lot. I feel pretty inspired, I have to say. That's an inspiring mission. It's like we journeyed to the moon and back. All from the comfort of our chairs. But we've only scratched the surface. There's so much more out there. That's what makes it so exciting. The journey's just beginning. And it's a journey for all of us.
to our listeners out there. Keep learning. Keep exploring. Keep looking up at the stars. With that sense of wonder. The cosmos is calling. Who knows what we'll find. There's a whole universe waiting to be discovered. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive into Artemis II. It's been a pleasure. Until next time, keep exploring.